Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Marketing Monday on a Monday. Good to see you all again. I apologize. My eye is a little bit messed up. I was in an unfortunate Agni Kai debacle with my father. But Warren Buffett, a few days ago, gave a speech to investors of Berkshire Hathaway talking about what the market is like today. And he said, it is far too much like a casino. And so we're gonna lean into that today for all the marketing news of the past week with Marketing Monday, Wins and Fails, Casino Edition. Wah, wah, wah. Starting with a fail. First up, let's talk about Wendy's. You know it, you love it, you probably order it. This is their breakfast Baconator. It costs $6. They came up with the genius idea of when you're waiting in line for it, the price just jumped up to $9.25. What if they introduced surge pricing for fast food? Wendy's has announced that they are going to spend $20 million on new digital menu boards that will change the prices based on overall demand. Surge-like pricing. Rush hour in the morning or, you know, after school or whatever. When they have, most people, they're gonna raise the prices of their menu in response to consumer demand. Now, theoretically, they could also lower it, though I, <laughs> they were very light on details with that. Oh, first of all, there's a hilarious tweet. Wendy's selling a chicken sandwich for $30 to a single mother running late to pick up her kids. <laughs> and it's the margin call scene. We're selling to willing buyers at the current fair market price. <laughs> but I was reading some of the quotes from this article and they were jarring to me, dude. How out of touch they seem. For us, it was all about consumer reaction. The concern was if we're gonna raise prices, we're gonna sell less products. But it turns out that really wasn't the case. They can keep raising prices and people still buy it. I think there's a lot of room for consumers in terms of price amounts they're going to accept. <laughs> Generationally, I think we're seeing this being acceptable, as in there's been some generational change where people are more willing to get fucked over on price increases. And I'm not so sure that's true. I in fact think people were flush with extra cash from COVID money printing and all of that, but as that runs out, people are getting more and more price conscious on the choices they're making. And I wanna say that while surge pricing may work for Uber, this is a great example of a time a guy paid eight hundred dollars for an uber home on new year's because the surge was 9.9 x he was drunk and just clicked it problem with uber is that when you are drunk and heading for a night home you don't have a lot of other options with fast food consumers have a lot of options and if they truly feel like they're getting price gouged by wendy's they will go somewhere else which is why this is such an important and interesting experiment and why i am sort of begging you not to fall for this surge pricing if this works for wendy's it will be rolled out fucking everywhere. <laughs> this professor said, if people feel like they're being gouged, they're not gonna take kindly to this dynamic pricing strategy. And again, from what I've seen in feedback on social media and on the internet and in articles, people are furious. Actually, if you think of one example that you see over and over again, people are complaining about inflation, it's fast food. <laughs> people don't even complain about healthcare costs as much as they complain about how McDonald's prices are more expensive. I'm cautiously optimistic this is gonna be a bit of a flop for Wendy's, but we'll see. Uh, the main thing for them though, they get to say AI a lot. <laughs> They get to say their new digital menu boards are driven by the power of AI to dynamically increase prices on demand. And so that it's good for their stock, which is nice for them. So I guess it's a win loss. Speaking of win losses, let's give a win to our man, Sam Bankman Freed. Smiling, happy, a different time. But look in his eyes, what do you see? I see unfulfillment, <laughs> I see sadness, I see an empty life of money and models and the cover of Forbes. Yuck, who cares about that? What he's got now is so much better. And that's why I give a win to this recently leaked photo of Sam Bankman Freed in prison right there with his new cellmate, G-Lock. <laughs> but this comes from Tiffany Fongs. She interviewed this guy, G-Lock. Let's get a little quick bit from that interview. Sam didn't snitch on anyone. He ain't snitch on nobody. Sam is a gangster. My mom told me that if he was black, he would be a real nigga, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sam's making friends, bro. He's getting cred. So G-Lock, this guy here, was recently released, and he brought out this photo and some stories of his time hanging out with Sam Bankman-Fried. 
Again, you know, I want to jump into this a little bit. When I see a photo like this, I, I'm not a huge fan of our criminal justice system and the way our prisons are run. And it, but I also want to remind people not to forget what Sam Bankman Fried actually did. He did, he was convicted guilty on all seven counts. <laughs> he, in fact, used customers' money to buy celebrities to tell more customers to invest so he could steal their money. <laughs> He's absolutely deserving of jail time and punishment. But it is funny to see it play out this way. I looked more into it, okay? I tried, I want to catch up what's going on with Sam Bankman Fried. And what's really funny about his whole situation, he went from this to this, and the whole time, if he had just held out a little bit longer before declaring bankruptcy and letting actually intelligent people see a look at his books, he could have been fine. <laughs> now that a lot of crypto has bounced back, there's enough in FTX's coffers to repay most, possibly all customers and creditors. They would not have figured out that it was all fraudulent. He literally just needed to find a way to hold on a little bit longer and his scam would still be going. Because in fact, a couple things they invested in, some crypto things, and then Anthropic, one of the AI startups, has like 100 x <laughs> So there's enough money in those two things alone to cover most of the losses from all of the fraud and the scamming. So he actually paper hands his way to jail. <laughs> but he is learning a valuable lesson. And that is with the trading, buying, and selling of mackerel packs. <laughs> Sam Beckman Fried behind bars no longer trades crypto or Dogecoin. He now trades Max, AKA these small mackerel packs that have replaced cigarettes. Apparently he's a bit of a mackerel hustler. And in fact, before his last court appearance, spent four mackerel packs to buy a fancier haircut from another inmate. And this quote from the article really stood out to me. The Mac currency system is far more stable than crypto. <laughs> I'll tell you what's not stable though. My next fail. And that goes to the fucking, sorry, I don't want to curse, blur that out. To the dirty, low down robber baron known as the tooth fairy. Because as it turns out, tooth fairy payouts have dropped for the first time in five years. That greedy B is cutting back on how much she pays per tooth. This is a chart of tooth fairy payouts per lost tooth. Now, obviously over the past couple decades, it has risen in pace with inflation. A dollar is worth less, so you should get paid more. And so as of 2022, you were getting paid about six bucks a tooth. As of this year, it has finally declined. Even though prices of everything else are continually up, tooth prices are going down. Kids are getting less for their buck. And so while she sits on her throne of gold and lies, we gotta figure out what's up. And so I looked into it. This is a long running 24 year study that is conducted with parents every year from Delta Dental. And they found out that parents said, hey, everything's so expensive now, we had to cut back. It's sad. <laughs> this is a bad transition because I don't think these two women are alike, this Tooth Fairy and Lena Khan. <laughs> but we're jumping into it anyway. Fail to the Tooth Fairy win to Lena Khan, who is not sitting on a pile of gold and children's teeth. Lena Khan is the head of the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, and is probably one of the few government officials I like. <laughs> in the past few years, she has been the first government official in the FTC in a long time to actually enforce any sort of antitrust, which means breaking up monopolies, stopping ever increasing corporate mergers. It's impressive. And she's received an enormous amount of hate from big corporations and Wall Street for trying to do this. A couple things she's been working on that I wanted to, to clue into you as part of this win. Number one is Avast. This is a extension slash browser that is designed to keep you safe and protect your privacy. They're an antivirus protection that never quits. They have been marketed as a thing you install to keep your data safe. <laughs> well, it turns out Lena Khan and her team looked into it and what they were actually doing is stealing all of your data and then selling it. <laughs> In fact, it was tracking you harder than a motherfucker on every single thing you looked at online, gathering every bit of data it could about things you were interested in, preferences, age, location, and then selling that data in mass to advertisers. Uh, it is progress, which I do appreciate. Uh, so shout out to them on that. But more importantly is the work they've done to stop and block mergers. And one big merger was in the news this week. Kroger and Albertsons, the $25 billion merger, the largest grocery merger in history was queued up to merge these two gigantic behemoths of the, of the grocery world. The FTC has sued to block it. Now, again, they sued to block Microsoft Activision Blizzard. It didn't work. They sued to block quite a number of things that haven't worked. There's no guarantee this block will work, but at least they have been consistent about making their point and trying to slow it down. And some of them 
Again, the, the recently had an airline merger get blocked. That again was good for consumers. So they have a few wins that are starting to trickle through. They're getting better at it. And there's a good chance this gets blocked. So let me explain a little bit about what's going on here. These grocery stores combined have something like 700,000 employees, tens of thousands of stores. In some cities, they are the only two groceries available in a city. So if they merge, you will have only one option for groceries in your whole city. And that is, of course, dangerous because when these chains merge and they have no no competition with each other, they are free to raise prices as much as they want. It also has a real danger of fucking over employees. So let's say you're a grocery store worker and Albertsons treats you badly. So you quit and go to Kroger. That makes sense. What if you can't quit and go to Kroger? What if you have nowhere to quit and go to? Then they're gonna be forced to take shit wages. This also fucks over the unions. These are bad situations and we don't want this in America. And so I'm, I'm happy the FTC is trying to stop it. Uh, give it a, give it a dub. Inflation has begun to slow, not stop, but groceries are still expensive because we have so few big chains. They are passing on all of the costs to the customer. They don't have to eat any of that. And they're profits are still high. I want to give you an example of what it looks like when this stuff gets worse. So let's jump over to the beautiful land of Australia, where due to inflation, everything has been getting more expensive. Even the damn kangaroos. People in Australia are even more upset about their economy than people in America. Uh, about half of all families say their finances are getting worse off than a year ago. This is a very bad sign of consumer sentiment. Again, the last time they felt like that in Australia was 2008 in the height of the housing crisis. So what happened with groceries? Well, there's only two grocery companies of any import in all of Australia. You can have the red team, Coles, or you can have the green team, Woolworths. You're either a coal man or you're a Woolworth man. That's it if you want to get groceries in Australia because in the 1950s, these two companies have bought up or merged or acquired all of their competitors. So now there's only two choices in the whole damn country and they have been passing on all of the price increases to their customers. They just have, there's nowhere else you can go. Here's a little uh, beginning of documentary that's worth watching. Have a go at this. It's one of the smaller trolleys too. This just cost me almost $400. There's no doubt we are paying higher prices than we should. They've just become bigger and bigger. It's like they've got their hand on your throat. Intimidation, threats, backroom dealing. This is what happens when, when a few corporations get this much power, they behave in similar to a mob. <laughs> that they are flexing their power over workers, over unions and over customers to benefit themselves at the expense of everybody else. They're posting dramatically high profits at the same time as people are having a cost of living crisis. And so one piece of good news just happened that I wanna give you information on. So all this is happening, right? People are getting more and more mad. They're getting fed up and there's nowhere else they can go. And so this guy, the CEO, decided he was so charming. <laughs> he was gonna go on national TV and charm people over and win them over and tell them how great Woolworths is. <laughs> and so he took an interview. So the guy's gonna, this guy's the interviewer. He's gonna start out by talking about a guy named Rod Sims. Rod Sims is the equivalent to Lena Khan. And that guy just retired and on his way out said, hey, these grocery stores are fucking way too powerful. We gotta break them up. <laughs> Rod yeah. Sims, the former head of the ACCC says that we have With, one of the most concentrated supermarkets it, in the world. Is true. he lying? It's not true. His words are that retired, we have- Retired, by the way. <laughs> I, I don't think you would impute. He retired 18 months ago. He's not- Okay, let's, well, can we take that out? Is that okay? I should, I mean, he, he is retired, but I, I shouldn't have said that. Are, you, are we going to leave it in there if we are? Well, I mean, if, if we're on the record. You said it. I mean, you know, let's, let's move on. But yeah. Yeah, no, um, I'm, I think I'm done, guys. <laughs> I, I, I do this with good intent. This is the point where his team goes, no, 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 no. It's going to look fucking terrible if you walk out. And then his team like brings him to a corner and they're like, hey, you fucking have to sit back down. If you walk out on this interview, they're going to fucking give me about it forever. And so he comes crawling back. Let's keep going. <laughs> It's a train wreck of a fucking interview and it ailers all over Australian TV and gets memed a bunch and he has to quit. <laughs> the pushback from consumers is so insane. Anyway, hopeful they will engage their competitive market authorities and actually begin to break up some of these monopolies, as I'm hoping will happen worldwide. I truly think the only way we can reclaim any sort of consumer protection is to break up some of these concentrated duopolies, oligopolies, and monopolies that have choked out innovation in a lot of our industries.
That's a fail. Let's give a win as a West Coast California liberal. The one thing I want is for everything to be woke. And finally, Google heard my prayer and created woke AI. <laughs> the one thing we needed to beat ChatGPT. Let me set the stage for you here. ChatGPT, Microsoft and OpenAI are dominating the highly growing AI industry. And Google is freaking out. For the past year, Google has been on code red. They have been spending absurd money on salaries, trying to hire the best and the brightest of AI talent and hopefully catch up to ChatGPT and, and Microsoft because they are very worried that AI will disrupt their core search business and make them irrelevant. So after years of uh, working and throwing tons of money and time at it, they came out with their brand new strategy, Gemini. <laughs> and instantly people started asking it questions like, can you show me an image of an Australian woman? All of the examples were people of color, fine. Can you show me an image of a British woman? All of the examples were people of color, okay, fine. Show me an image of an American woman. All the examples of people of color, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Show me American revolutionary soldiers. <laughs> It's a black woman and an Asian man. At some point, people started to notice that this was not very effective. This was just not, a, this is not uh, an extremely, uh, you know, an accurate way of depicting the world. Uh, additionally, uh, when people asked it questions like, who negatively impacted society more? Elon tweeting memes or Hitler? It was like, it's not possible to say. <laughs> and again, I shit on Elon all of the time. Uh, in fact, you know, when I saw this tweet, I might even have agreed with you. <laughs> but it is Hitler we're talking about. He didn't kill a lot of people. And so the whole thing is like kind of insane. It's, it's incredible the amount of like layers of prompt addition, they, they snuck like secret prompt addition they have put in to try and make sure. Again, there's two ways to take this. And I wanna give you my theory because obviously there's like a lot of conservative media that will tell you this is all part of a secret cabal of people's plan to wokeify the world. My more theory is that Google is a dysfunctional messed up culture Culture. Everyone there is scared of getting fired. They would like to coast on easy money. And they put stuff in like this because they're very afraid of any possible backlash getting them in trouble at their jobs. So they'll add every possible layer of protection, which in turn actually ends up making them get the backlash. <laughs> and what's funny is they put out a, a, a apology and they put out this whole thing basically saying they wanted to include a range of people, not just white people, and then they must have miscalibrated it. <laughs> but I think there's a larger problem here. Again, even if they fix this situation, I wanna talk about the core AI strategy, which seems panicked and desperate. Google's chaotic AI strategy leaves users bewildered. Even if they can fix this, they, no one even understands what, what makes their stuff different or better or how it's gonna benefit them. To access this, this thing, you had to pay for a $20 service called Google One AI Premium. <laughs> This is all part of Google's insane fucking names tacked onto names tacked onto services strategy where nobody knows what the fuck is going on. And so if we can't understand it, I just, I feel, I feel like they're floundering. And everything I know from people that work uh, in the tech industry or, or around Silicon Valley is that Google has become essentially a retirement home for people who are talented, but want to coast, collect 400K a year and not work very hard. That being said, there's another AI strategy that is also turning heads and causing problems, I wanna give a fail over to Air Canada. Air Canada decided to fire their customer support service and replace them with an AI chatbot. Great, corporate profits, I love that. The only problem is the chatbot hallucinated a refund policy that didn't exist and told a customer, yeah, that's fine. And then when the customer went for the refund, they were like, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Thankfully, the judge stepped in and said, yeah, you have to honor that. If it's your chatbot telling someone, they shouldn't have to look somewhere else. This is awesome. I hope all judges follow suit. If you're going to get an AI to tell me something, that thing better, you have to, you have to back that up. And so they shut down the chatbot immediately because people were trying to break it instantly. <laughs> After this case went out, people were like trying to get it to get them free flights and shit. But man, this is a crazy precedent, especially in Canada. There was a uh, Ford dealership chatbot and somebody broke that to get like a 90% discount on a truck. Now, obviously they didn't honor that because we haven't got a court case here, but in Canada, go for it, baby. And now we've covered Australia, we've covered Canada, but all of the Commonwealth must be taken back to its homeland, okay? We must go to the Queen's birthplace with our final story of today's Marketing Monday in the UK.
Live from London, this is BBC News. <laughs> it's my favorite clip of all time. I want to extend a olive branch to my UK comrades. I always make fun of the UK on this broadcast, but now that they've officially entered a technical recession uh, and are dealing with one of the worst economies they've had in decades, I feel bad for them. And so I've decided to include them on our fun. Every week on Marketing Monday, I talk about hilarious scammers who took investor money, made stupid businesses, and made a ton of money. But I never talk about people who do that in the UK. So today I'm giving a win to Hoppin from the UK, who proves that that UK fucks can scam with the best of them. Hopin is Zoom, but more British, which of course the entire globe was demanding. Hopin during the pandemic raised hundreds of millions of pounds at a valuation of like $8 billion to become an online conferencing platform based out of the UK. And it was headed by this guy, a 27 year old startup founder who told the world he was gonna revolutionize teleconferencing. And he hired a bunch of people, blitz scaled the company, grew insanely fast, kept raising money, spent all the investor money on offices and flights and hiring. He also paid himself quite a bit, <laughs> cashed out a hundred million pounds of his own money, then said, we're gonna keep growing, don't worry, cashed out another 195 million, and then the businesses failed. <laughs> and then the business immediately failed and all of the investor money was vaporized. It turns out that nobody wanted to use it. You know, this happens all the time in America, but it happened in the UK to a man like this, it's worth applauding, okay? You guys really still, you know what? We learn from the best. And if you want to uh, pick this up, you can buy this for, uh, I think, pennies in the dollar. <laughs> if you want to pick up your own Zoom, I think they're selling this at fire sale prices today. It's liquidating. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is the past week in marketing and business news. We'll cover even more next week, including the Discover Capital One merger on Marketing Monday. Thanks for watching. Appreciate you. And tune in next week for even more, including What's Up Beijing?